Throughout the early to mid 2000s, 50 Cent and G Unit not only dominated the music industry, but they were dominating other industries as well the clothing industry, the shoe industry, and they even appeared in a video game. G Unit is undoubtedly one of the biggest rap groups to ever exist and could be considered one of the most legendary. But what if I told you that G Unit, in my eyes, is still a what if? Like most rap groups, G Unit suffered a tragic ending that saw tensions rise within the group with multiple members being kicked out and at one point, G-Unit was disbanded as a whole. Today, we look into exactly what led to the fall of G-Unit. If you want to watch this video completely uncensored and uncut, you can watch this version on my Patreon for just $2, patreon.com slash JohnAnthonyHD. Now, before we look into the fall of G-Unit, we must look into how the group was even formed in the first place. Let's take you back to Southside Jamaica, Queens, before 50 Cent was even a known rapper, he grew up alongside his lifelong friends Marvin Bernard and Christopher Lloyd. Marvin went under the rap name Tony Yayo, while Christopher went under the rap name Lloyd Banks. Lloyd Banks and Tony Yayo would begin rapping in the streets of South Jamaica, whilst 50 Cent, who was known as Boo Boo at the time, was hustling in the streets. 50 Cent would eventually begin rapping in 1997, and eventually, Tony Ayo, 50 Cent, and Lloyd Banks would become a part of their newly formed rap group called 134 All-Stars. 134 was a street that Banks, Yayo, and 50 all grew up on. This was the name of G-Unit before they called themselves G-Unit. 134 All-Stars consisted of 50 Cent, Lloyd Banks, Tony Ayo, Bangham Smurf, Mutt Low, and Fat Shah. An early picture from 1994 shows 50 Cent hanging with Mutt Low and early members of the 134 All-Stars. 50 Cent would eventually land a deal with Columbia Records in 1999 and was gearing up to drop his debut studio album called Power of the Dollar. This album, unfortunately, never ended up releasing due to 50 Cent being shot nine times in the summer of 2000. After surviving the deadly shooting, 50 Cent was actually blackballed from the music industry after being dropped by Columbia Records because nobody wanted to sign 50 Cent due to all the beef he had. While recovering from the deadly shooting, 50 Cent was staying in the Poconos, which was located in Pennsylvania, to lay low. In 2001, 50 Cent had a vision. He wasn't going to give up on his rap career just because he was blackballed, so he took matters into his own hands. 50 Cent called a meeting in the Poconos to which Lloyd Banks, Tony Ayo, Bangham Smurf, El Dorado, and other G-Unit members would come together. It was at this moment that 50 announced that he was coming back to making music and needed a crew to back him, so G-Unit would officially be formed. After forming G-Unit, 50 Cent came up with a plan. He said that if the industry is going to blackball him, then he'll just release a mixtape independently and blow up on his own. This formula would become a trademark formula in hip-hop that would be used for years to come. 50 would link up with New York DJ Sha Money XL to work on his mixtapes, and on April 26, 2002, 50 Cent dropped his official debut mixtape Guess Who's Back, which was released on independent label Full Clip Entertainment. After the release of this mixtape, 50 Cent would immediately gain buzz throughout the streets of New York. 50 Cent saw the attention his music was getting, so he decided to keep the magic going, and this time, he would officially introduce G-Unit to the world. On June 1st, 2002, 50 Cent and G-Unit dropped their mixtape, 50 Cent is the Future, and on the cover appeared the two only rappers of G-Unit, Tony Yayo and Lloyd Banks. This mixtape introduced G-Unit to the world in an iconic way, with tracks like Bump That Street Mix, which saw all three of them rap as a collective, the track, The Banks Workout, was used as a way to introduce Lloyd Banks and show off his amazing lyrical ability. At the end of the track, 50 Cent went on a legendary rant, introducing everyone to Lloyd Banks. Yeah! Lloyd Banks. What's up? This mixtape also had the legendary track, G-Unit Soldiers. At the end of this track, G-Unit member Bangham Smurf goes on a crazy rant. The track Tony Yayo Explosion was used as a way to introduce Tony Yayo to the world, and the track featured a 50 cent hook to which you can never go wrong with the 50 cent hook. The rap group UTP would make an appearance on this mixtape to which members Juvenile and Young Buck would rap a verse on the track, a little bit of everything. This is when 50 Cent would meet Young Buck, who would eventually become a full-time member of G-Unit after leaving UTP due to 50 Cent taking a liking to Young Buck. This was also an expanding opportunity for G-Unit, because Young Buck represents the South, as he's from Tennessee. This mixtape would also be where DJ Who Kid would be introduced as a member of G-Unit, but Who Kid made an appearance on his debut mixtape, Guess Who's Back, on the track called Who Kid. After the release of 50 Cent is the Future, it was clear that 50 Cent was undoubtedly the biggest free agent in hip-hop. 50 Cent and G-Unit's buzz was getting hotter and hotter. Eventually, after 17 days of dropping that mixtape on June 17, 2002, 50 Cent would receive a phone call from Eminem, who was interested in signing him to Shady Records. 
After 50 Cent flew out to LA to meet with Eminem and Dr. Dre, the deal was inked and 50 Cent officially signed a $1 million deal with Shady Records. After signing to Shady Records, Interscope granted 50 Cent his own label, which was where G-Unit Records was officially born. As 50 Cent and G-Unit's buzz grew, they continued their mixtape run on August 1st, 2002, when they dropped the No Mercy No Fear mixtape. This cover is one of my personal favorites. As you can see, G-Unit is spelled out with guns. G-Unit would continue their momentum with more mixtapes like God's Plan on November 1st, 2002 and Automatic Gunfire on January 1st, 2003. On February 6th, 2003, 50 Cent dropped his all-time classic debut studio album, Get Rich or Die Tryin', and on this album, of course, features G-Unit. The track Bloodhound features Young Buck, the track Like My Style features Tony Yayo, and the track Don't Push Me has Eminem and Lloyd Banks on it. Get Rich or Die Tryin' would go on to sell 872,000 copies within the first week, making it the highest selling debut hip hop album in the first week of all time. After that, 50 Cent would become a global phenomenon, and he took all of his G-Unit homies with him for the ride. After the release of Get Rich or Die Tryin', 50 Cent and G-Unit took the world by storm. The very next month, in March of 2003, we would see the birth of the legendary mixtape series, which was the G-Unit radio series. On March 29th, 2003, the G-Unit Radio Part 1 Smoke and Day 2 mixtape was released, which featured Snoop Dogg as a special guest and saw several features from him. They followed up with the G-Unit Radio Part 2 International Ballers mixtape on June 12th, 2003. As G-Unit's buzz grew hotter and hotter, we would see 50 Cent ink a deal with Reebok for the release of the G-Unit shoes called the Reebok G6 and more G-Unit merchandise. At this point, G-Unit is dominating the rap game, the mixtape circuit, and now the G-Unit shoes are flying off the shelves, so it only made sense that G-Unit now had to drop a studio album as a group. On November 14, 2003, G-Unit would drop their debut studio album, Beg for Mercy, which would go on to sell 377,000 copies within the first week and included smash hits like Stunt 101 and Poppin' Them Thangs. 2003 was undoubtedly the year of 50 Cent and G-Unit. But through all this success, a beef was going on behind the scenes with a longtime member of G-Unit. If you remember earlier in this video, I mentioned a member of G-Unit by the name of Bangham Smurf. Smurf was 50's right hand man, and the true definition of a G-Unit soldier. He could be seen hanging out with G-Unit on several different occasions like photo shoots, and even appeared in the Inda Club music video. According to one of Smurf's close friends named Domination, Smurf allegedly retaliated for 50 Cent after 50 got shot. So as you could tell, Bangham Smurf and 50 Cent were really close. But unfortunately, in 2003, he had a falling out with 50 Cent and the rest of G-Unit. The beef would begin when 50 Cent and G-Unit were going overseas on their No Mercy No Fear tour. 50 Cent let Bangham Smurf come on tour with him and the rest of G-Unit, but instead sent Smurf back home to the hood to get his mind right. While 50 and G-Unit were overseas, Bangham Smurf would actually end up getting locked up for reckless endangerment and criminal possession of a firearm. Smurf allegedly tried calling 50 to post his bail, which was set at $75,000, but 50 actually said no to bailing him out. This is where the beef would officially begin, as Smurf and his homies thought 50 was being disloyal for not bailing him out. After getting no response from 50, he would be forced to put his mother's house up for bail bond along with an additional $7,500. After Smurf got released from jail, he called 50 once again to ask why no one bailed him out of jail. And according to Smurf, 50 was immediately hostile and started beefing. He yelled at Smurf, being frustrated that he was getting into trouble, as 50 was trying to clean up his life and not risk his own freedom getting locked up for Smurf's reckless behavior. After that happened, Smurf and his homies didn't retaliate at all. In 2003, Bangham Smurf did an article with the Source magazine where he talked about how he felt hurt by 50 Cent leaving him in jail and not bailing him out. 50 Cent caught wind of this so he actually took to wax to respond to Bangham Smurf. On August 13th, 2003, the G-Unit Radio Part 3 Taking It To The Streets mixtape dropped and on the Sleep remix, 50 Cent goes on a rant in the beginning of the track completely dissing Bangham Smurf. On the track, 50 says that he hears Smurf talking about him and calls him a dirtbag. He then says that he took $325,000 back from Smurf, which was a reference to the company that Smurf and 50 co-found called Hollow Point Entertainment. When Smurf was released from prison, 50 Cent made him sign off the company, leaving Smurf with $10,000 and leaving 50 Cent with $325,000, completely taking back all of the money that he gave Smurf to fund the company. Hey, hey Smurf, don't think I'll hear you out there talking about me, you little dirtbag. Brush your teeth before you talk about me. Wash under your arms, you smell like Queensbridge. Yeah. Tell them niggas how I took that 325000 back from you. I'm like, God, do you You know, God give it. God take it away. 
I come back off tour, I'ma catch you, I'ma whoop the skin off your after this, Smurf would start his own record label called GF Records, to which he signed his best friend and former G-Unit affiliate rapper Domination to the label. After hearing 50 Cent's subliminal shots, he decided to drop a diss track of his own called What's Beef, which was him and Domination going at 50 Cent and the rest of G-Unit. Muscle head, hard body tissue, can't stop a pistol, bet you drop and shrivel when them rockets hit you. So you ain't a gangster with them whole ways, before you come outside, 10 Look both ways, you still frontin' with a vest on stage Come to the block and test your Glock another spot besides the firing range Beef is when banks can't walk in the streets 50 gotta stay inside that bulletproof Jeep Thought better tuck away that G-Unit piece Show up at your car, search 20 after that, 50 Cent and G-Unit wouldn't respond until the next year in April 2004 when the G-Unit Radio Part 6 motion picture mixtape was released. On the track, These N-Words Ain't Hood, on 50 Cent's verse, he dissed Bangham Smurf and Domination when he said that they used to be cool, but he's not stuck in the hood with him. He dissed Domination when he said that he's never gonna blow up, and Smurf is the reason why, because he's still stuck in the streets. Do we used to be cool, but I ain't stuck with you, I grew up with you, but I don't f with you. There's a message in my music, can you hear it, Kai? Your man's never gonna blow and you're the reason why. Bangham Smurf, Domination, and his homie heard this and had enough of 50 Cent dissing them, so two months later, in June 2004, Hot 97's annual Summer Jam was taking place in New York City. 50 Cent and G-Unit were set to perform, so Bangham Smurf, Domination, and the rest of his goons decided to attend the show. During 50's performance, they would begin taunting him from the crowd, to which 50 Cent would try to ignore them, but eventually, 50 had enough. 50 Cent would grab a bottle of water, and he threw water on them, to which Smurf would jump the barricade, but the security rushed him. This led to one of Smurf's guys to throw a chair at 50 Cent, to which 50 caught the chair like a damn cat with them reflexes. 50 never threw the chair back at them, but Smurf's goons continued throwing chairs at 50 Cent and G-Unit as chairs were just flying in the crowd. The beef died out, and in 2008, Bangham Smurf would actually end up getting deported back to Trinidad and Tobago where he was born. 50 Cent would react to this news. When he was asked about his thoughts on Smurf being deported, he went on to say that Smurf is his baby boy. Huh? Let me ask you a question. What do you think about Smurf being deported? You know what I'm saying? I know you probably heard about that. You said who? Smurf? Smurf. Yeah. Yeah, look, look, look. That's my baby. You understand what I'm saying? Smurf is my baby boy. Fast forward all the way to April 28th, 2020. 50 Cent released his book, Hustle Harder, Hustle Smarter. And in the book, he revealed what actually happened between him and Bangham Smurf. 50 revealed that he sent Smurf home from the No Mercy, No Fear tour due to Smurf getting into an altercation with their tour manager over a Mitchell and Ness jersey. The problem started with Mitchell and Ness, the legendary Philadelphia sports clothing company, sent some complimentary throwback jerseys to our hotel. This was the era when Mission Lynette's jerseys were basically the official uniform for hip-hop. Everyone wanted to be seen in one, and some of the rare editions were worth thousands of dollars. Even though the shirts were meant for me, the package ended up in the hands of a guy named Marcus, who was our tour manager. He knew I always buy my own clothes, so he decided to take a couple of the jerseys for himself. He felt that since he was the tour manager, they were some of the spoils he was entitled to. Bangham Smurf didn't see it that way, though. Bangham was someone from Southside that I was considering signing to G-Unit, so I'd taken him on the road to help him get some exposure. Bangham had potential, but he made the mistake of thinking just being on the road meant he already made it. He started drinking his own juice before he proved anything. 
He didn't have a single. He didn't have any buzz. The girls didn't look at him and say, who's the cute one? To the world, he was just another dude on stage shouting the end of my lines. That experience alone got him so gassed that he thought the rules didn't apply to him. The morning after the Philly show, we were scheduled to get on the bus at 5 a.m. and head to the next city. But instead of my alarm clock, I got an early morning wake up from the sounds of a fight taking place under my window. I pulled back the shades to see an unexpected sight. Marcus and Bangham rolling around in the street, trading blows over a Michelin S jersey. It's mine, I could hear Bangham shouting. Nah, that ain't George, yelled Marcus. Yours had a piece of gum stuck on the side. This is mine. Apparently, Bangham had decided one of those jerseys was his. And when Marcus wouldn't hand it over, Bangham was just going to take it. Not what I wanted to deal with at the crack of dawn. I went outside and immediately broke them up. Then I asked Bangham what the hell he was thinking. Nah, Fifth, Bangham started to explain. He's trying to take my shirt. I had to check him. I wasn't trying to hear it. Man, you know I told everyone, no fights on the store. Then I looked at Marcus and said, point to Bangham, get this punk a bus ticket. He's going home. It wasn't until that moment that Bangham realized I wasn't playing. When I said zero tolerance, I meant zero. If you're going to maintain control of your team, you must make people respect the repercussions, even if it means ending a relationship. So Bangham got sent home right then and there. He'd have plenty of time to drink his own juice back in Queens. Bangham thought he was bigger than the crew, but it turned out he didn't know how to move on his own. He started working with some other local rappers, and from time to time would try to get me to support them, but nothing really caught my ear. Without my support, no one wanted to give him a break. Instead of being on the road with me, making legal money and seeing the world, he eventually caught a case back in Queens. He asked me to bail him out, but I explained to him that wasn't my job. He eventually got deported back to Trinidad, where he was born. To this day, he blames me, not himself, for his situation. Whenever you find success in life, there will be people who believe some of it belongs to them. Bangham was that sort of person. When you remove them from your life, instead of looking in the mirror, they get angry at you. If I had let Bangham slide with a warning, I would have lost my authority. All the other Eagles on the tour, and there were plenty of them, would have started the bubble too. Soon, they wouldn't have been fighting over Michelin S jerseys. They would have been beefing over girls. Who got the most time on stage or who was getting paid what? In 2002, Dr. Dre became interested in signing a local Compton rapper who went under the stage name The Game. The only problem was that Game had absolutely zero buzz. After Dre contacted Game in late 2002, the two would begin working on trying to build some buzz for the game because in the early to mid 2000s, the West Coast hip hop scene was dying out. During this time, the game would be introduced to none other than 50 Cent who was gearing up to drop his debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying. The game began hanging out with 50 Cent and the rest of G-Unit, and he even appeared in 50 Cent's Into Club music video. The game and 50 Cent were in the studio together for the first time that year, where they would record their first ever collaboration track called So Hard, which the track appeared on the G-Unit Radio Part 3 Taking It to the Streets mixtape. After hearing Game's performance on this track, Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre had a vision. They wanted the game to become an official member of G-Unit, so Dre would later approach 50 Cent with the idea. Dre told 50 that G-Unit has the East on lock, the South on lock with Young Buck, and that the game was the missing piece to represent G-Unit on the West. 50 was hesitant at first, but being the real dude he was, 50 Cent agreed to do Dr. Dre the favor, and in 2003, the game would officially become a member of G-Unit. 50 Cent would then begin to work on getting the game some buzz, so what did he do? He put game on the mixtape circuit, and in January 2004, the game would make his debut in the G-Unit radio series on G-Unit Radio Part 5, All Eyes on Us. The game would appear on the cover and would feature on multiple tracks as he was being introduced to the world. In the summer of 2004, the game would actually get his own edition of the G-Unit radio series with part 8, The Fifth Element. After seeing game's work rate and talent, 50 Cent had a plan that would guarantee the game to be a success in the industry. Throughout 2004, 50 Cent was working on his second studio album called The St. Valentine's Day Massacre, which was scheduled for a February 14th, 2005 release. The game was also gearing up to drop his debut album, so one night, when 50 Cent and the game were at 50's mansion in Connecticut in his home recording studio, 50 Cent actually decided to mute his vocals and give the game some songs from his album. The songs that 50 Cent gave the game were Hate It or Love It, How We Do, Higher, Church for Thugs, and Special. 
It's not that I can't stop, it's that I won't stop, I make it hot. I do it. It's not that I can't stop, it's that I won't stop, I make it hot, I do it. After that, the rollout to Game's debut album would officially begin on September 7, 2004. The Game dropped his single, West Side Story, to which 50 Cent performed the hook on this track. The track debuted at number 99 on the Billboard Hot 100, so Game was finally gaining some buzz. He followed up a couple of months later on November 23rd, 2004. The Game dropped his single, How We Do, which of course featured 50 Cent, as 50 was the one who gave Game the song. After the release of this track, it would debut at number 65 on the Billboard Hot 100, so 50's plan to garner game some buzz was clearly working. Shortly after the release of this track, as 2004's coming to an end would be where tensions between the game and 50 Cent would begin rising. After game started blowing up, so did his ego. He also wanted to drop his album before 50 Cent, so this actually caused 50 Cent to push his album release to March of 2005. This definitely rubbed 50 Cent the wrong way being that 50 Cent was the biggest artist in the world at this point, so for Game to be prioritized over him made 50 a little mad at Dr. Dre, Jimmy Iovine, and The Game. Around this time, The Game also started becoming reckless with who he was dissing. He was starting beef with everyone, from Jay-Z to a DJ North Carolina. So 50 Cent had to call Jay-Z and the DJ to apologize on behalf of The Game, because 50 didn't want Game to end his own career by dissing guys like Jay-Z, who could have, in quotes, put his lights out early on in his career, as 50 Cent explained in a later interview on Big Boy's Neighborhood. And right after the record was out, it was like, you know, I'm hot. Because of how many records it sold at that point. Were there times when you guys were on the road, or you seen something when he was with G-Unit that you was like, oh man. Uh, never. Like, never. It was never any, like he called me actually. Because he had said something about Jay-Z, he said he could suck his, you know, and... Memphis Bleak and Beanie Siegel, he did it overseas and it came back mm. right away. And he had called me and I was like, y'all, let me talk to him, you know, because it was so early that Jay could have kind of put his lights out. Right. You know what I mean? Like, your record just came out last week. Why did you say that? You know what I'm saying? It was really his first performance, like. Mm. You know, he went off and he, he, he said these things and then I was busy patching that. I was putting band-aids over stab wounds with in that situation. On January 8th, 2005, The Game dropped his debut studio album, The Documentary, which went on to sell a crazy 586,000 copies within the first week, and it was clear that The Game was now an established mainstream artist. It would be a week after his album dropped that the beef with 50 Cent would reach a boiling point. Game went overseas to promote his album where he would diss Jay-Z once again. After Game came back from tour, he did a complete 360 on 50 Cent and G-Unit. He wasn't giving 50 Cent any credit for helping him and stopped wearing G-Unit clothing. On January 28th, 2005, the official single for 50 Cent and the game song Hate It or Love It dropped, which was a smash hit and would be the game's highest charting single on Billboard to date. In February 2005, 50 Cent dropped a track called Piggy Bank, which was a single to his upcoming album The Massacre. On this track, 50 Cent this Jadakiss and Fat Joe for working with Ja Rule on their 2004 track called New York. Shortly after the release of this track, the game was doing an interview, and when he was asked about 50 Cent's beef with Jadakiss and Fat Joe, he simply said that it's between them and 50, and that he has no problems with them and is actually friends with them. This would be the absolute final straw for 50, as he saw the game as disloyal for not backing him during his beef, so in 50 Cent's eyes, the game was pretty much done. On February 21st, 2005, the music video for Hate It or Love It premiered on TRL, and it was speculated that 50 Cent actually didn't even want to sit in the front seat of the lowrider with Game in one of the scenes due to his tension with Game at the time. Just a week later, on February 28th, 2005, 50 Cent was promoting his upcoming album, The Massacre. During an interview with Ed Lover on Power 105.1 is where 50 Cent would officially kick the game out of G-Unit live on the air after Game was disloyal towards him and the rest of G-Unit. See, I'm not a fake person. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. You see what I'm saying? And for me, it, he has a lot of inconsistencies. You know what I'm saying? Like, that it, It's incredible that he would come back and forget how much work, how much I've done for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, personally, you know what I'm saying? I, I, so where does he stand as far as G-Unit is concerned right across now? Across the street or around the corner. He's not in my camp. Not at all. No way. When 50 Cent said this, the game was actually still in New York, and he did an interview with Angie Martinez at Hot 97. And during the interview, a fan called in and told Game that 50 Cent kicked him out of G-Unit live on air. Who's this? It's Toad, Far Rockaway. What's up, baby? 
I just want to know what's up with gang, what's up with him and 50. 50 talking real greasy, you know? What, what exactly? What'd he say? Somebody asked the weird game still with G-Unit. He said around the block. He said across the street around the block. He Ooh. said, yo, he said next album he ain't doing nothing for you. You gonna sell like 500,000 copies. That's what he said? That's what he said. Hmm. Wow. What you think Dude. about that, man? Yo, I, game, don't hurt this cat. Don't hurt this cat, man. This is a clown, man. Hey, yo, I'm from Rockaway, Queens, man. Hey, yo, I'm a, hey, yo, you know what I'm going to do, man? What you going to do, baby? I'm going to be easy and I'm going to make good music, homie. That's all, and that's you, all. And you know what else I'm going to do, big dog? What you going to do? I'm going to keep it 100% hood and still cross over. That's what's up, baby. All the time, from Rockaway, Queens to Compton. He's a clown, man. Hey, yo, man, the documentary, homie. No doubt, no doubt, baby. After Game left Angie Martinez's show, later that night, 50 Cent actually came into Hot 97 to sit down with Funkmaster Flex for an interview. During the interview, they talked about 50 Cent's issues with the game. While 50 Cent went on a tangent about Game, saying that while Dre and him were trying to help Game build his career, he was being reckless, he also revealed that he actually gave the game the tracks I mentioned earlier for his album, and 50 said that the only reason why people even listen to the game in the first place is because of 50 Cent. During his rant, the game was actually still in New York, and was actually listening to this interview, so Game and a bunch of goons pulled up to Hot 97 while 50 Cent was being interviewed. 50 Cent would leave the building through the back door, but downstairs in the lobby of the building, a shootout would occur between Game and 50's entourage, resulting in someone being shot in the leg. Enough's enough. It's hot 97. Funk Flex, we focus. Hey, it's okay, fellas. Hey, it's all great. After this, the Game and 50 would call a truce a couple of weeks later on March 9th, 2005, where they would get together at the Boys Choir in Harlem on the anniversary of Biggie's death for a charity event where 50 would launch the G-Unity Foundation. This truce would be short-lasted because that summer in June 2005, the Game was performing at Hot 97 Summer Jam in New York, and he infamously dissed 50 Cent and the entirety of G-Unit on stage, and this is where the G-Unit campaign would officially begin. After that, Game would actually never end up coming back into G-Unit. If you want a full, in-depth look into 50 Cent and the game's beef, check out the video I made on it. I will link it in the description because this video is more so about G-Unit, so I'm not going to go in-depth with this beef. Now that we have the beef out of the way for now, let's look into how G-Unit performed as solo artists. We all know that G-Unit's solo acts were very underwhelming in terms of sales and overall work rate. We're going to take an in-depth look into each solo artist of G-Unit and how their career went starting off with none other than the talk of New York, Tony Yayo. I gave you the history of Tony Yayo's beginning in rap. So let's look into when he blew up because at one point, Yayo was without a doubt the most popular out of the group. In 2002, as G-Unit was gaining an insane amount of buzz, unfortunately, on December 31st, 2002, Tony A was arrested during a New Year's Eve party in Manhattan for first degree possession of a loaded firearm by a convicted felon when Yeo was caught with a Glock 20 handgun and a Colt AR-15 in the trunk of his car. Yeo was sentenced for jumping bail and would remain behind bars for a year. This was a very bad time for Yeo to get locked up because he actually missed G-Unit's actual blow up and that's the reason why Yeo didn't appear on G-Unit's album Beg for Mercy and on the cover you can see they just photoshopped him on the wall. But what if I told you that being locked up actually made Tony Yayo the most popular G-Unit member? While Tony Yayo was locked up, the free Yayo movement would begin. And most of the shows that 50 Cent and G-Unit performed at, the crowd would chant free Yayo. The free Yayo campaign would become so big that Eminem would actually get in on it. At the 2003 Grammys, Eminem performed his hit song Lose Yourself and during his performance, he infamously wore a free Yayo shirt. After this, Tony Yayo had an insane amount of buzz and it seemed like he was going to come out of prison and blow up. But something bad happened. On January 8th, 2004, Tony A was released from prison on parole, but the very next day he was arrested again for possession of a forged passport and would go right back to prison. Eventually, on February 24th, 2004, Tony A would finally be released from prison and would be free for the first time since 2002. This is when Tony A would fail to capitalize on his momentum. 
After all the buzz from the free Yayo movement, Yayo needed to drop his debut album ASAP. The problem was, Tony Yayo didn't release any singles or body of music solo until the next year on May 17, 2005, when he dropped the first single for his album called So Seductive. The song debuted at number 67 on the US Billboard R&B and Hip Hop chart, and was definitely a hit record, but it did feature 50 Cent, and in 2005, if you had 50 Cent on a song, it was guaranteed to be a hit. Ye would follow up with the second single on July 18, 2005 with the track called Curious, which would perform worse than So Seductive, peaking at number 94 on the US Billboard Hot R&B slash Hip Hop songs. After that, on August 30th, 2005, Tony Yayo finally dropped his debut studio album Thoughts of a Predicate Felon, and the album would debut at number 2 on the Billboard 200, selling 214,000 copies within the first week. Many people perceive this as a flop, due to all the hype and momentum Tony Ayo had in 2003 and 2004. This album would eventually go platinum, selling over a million copies to date, so in my opinion, I don't think this album was that bad of a flop like critics say it is. Another great people had about this album were the single selections. People weren't happy that Yayo's first song since his release from prison was so seductive, and it had people questioning what exactly Tony Yayo was doing in that prison cell. The only reason why this album is considered a flop is because of just how big G-Unit was in 2005, literally at their peak. Shoes flying off the shelves and merchandise, but yet, Tony Yayo couldn't even manage to outsell the game. Tony Yayo was never the most talented rapper, but I think he did wait a little too long to drop this album. Had he dropped it in summer 2004, I think the sales could have been double. People got tired of waiting for Yayo to drop. The free Yayo campaign was already old and done with by the time this even dropped. After this album, Tony Yayo actually never ended up dropping another album again, so maybe Yayo himself felt like he flopped as well. Tony Yayo would go on to be featured in Junior Projects and 50 Cent's albums, but would never fully take off as a solo act making Yayo one of the many members of G-Unit to have a failed solo career. Yayo had a decent body of work on the mixtape circuit, but only real hardcore fans will listen to the mixtapes, which Yayo failed to become mainstream enough to have a fan base even as big as games. Music aside though, I will give credit where it's due. In my opinion, Tony Yayo is the realest G-Unit member of all time. He has always stuck by 50's side, and is the real definition of a ride or die G-Unit soldier. Just look at the henchman beef. Yeah, Yayo started it by slapping his son. But Yeo was willing to go to war for G-Unit, which I don't think the other members are really willing to do. For that reason, Tony Yeo has always been my personal favorite member of G-Unit. Let's look into another G-Unit member's solo career, none other than the Punchline King, Lloyd Banks. I'm going to start this off by saying Lloyd Banks had all the potential in the world to become a major star. He had all the tools, charisma, flow, and most importantly, he was undoubtedly the most lyrical artist in G-Unit. Lloyd Banks' solo career officially started on July 26, 2003 with the release of his debut mixtape, Money in the Bank. From there, he would release his follow-up mixtape, Mo Money in the Bank, on September 20th, 2003. The next year, in January 2004, Lloyd Banks would actually be awarded as the Mixtape Artist of the Year at the 2004 Mixtape Awards. Lloyd Banks' solo career was looking very promising, so now it was time to see how well his record would sell. Lloyd Banks would begin the rollout for his debut album, The Hunger For More. On April 27, 2004, the first single for his debut album released called On Fire, and this song was an instant smash hit and would end up peaking at number 8 on the Billboard 100. This was a very promising look for Banks, so on June 29, 2004, Lloyd Banks dropped his debut album, The Hunger For More, which was a big success, debuting at number 1 on the Billboard 200, selling 433,000 copies within the first week, so it was clear that Banks had the most potential in G-Unit so far. Unfortunately for Banks, this would be his solo peak, and it was only downhill from here. Banks would release only one mixtape from September 2004 all the way to May of 2006. No album, no singles, no work at all. On October 10, 2006, Lloyd Banks dropped his second album, Rotten Apple. This album would debut at number 3 on Billboard, only selling 143,000 copies within the first week, which was awful, especially for how big June it was at the time. After this, Banks wouldn't release an album for several years, but would go on to drop several mixtapes throughout the late 2000s. In 2010, Banks seemed to have sort of a career revival, as he was gearing up to drop his album The Hunger For More 2. Lloyd Banks actually dropped a hit song. On February 9, 2010, Lloyd Banks dropped the first single to his album called the Beamer Benzer Bentley, and this song was a hit, peaking at number 49 on the Billboard Hot 100. After the success of this song, it seemed as if Lloyd Banks was ready to make a full comeback, but nothing really came out of it, and the album only sold 49,000 copies in the first week. So what was it that killed Lloyd Banks' crazy momentum? 
Was it the shift in rap music as gangsta rap was dying? While that could play a part into Banks' solo career as an artist commercially failing, I think it's mainly attributed to his laziness. 50 Cent has publicly spoken about how lazy Lloyd Banks is, so that definitely played the biggest role in his career demise because Banks was clearly capable of dropping hit records as proven with Beamer, Benz, or Bentley, but he failed to put in the effort making Lloyd Banks another junior member to have a failed solo career. Success of power was one of my greatest accomplishments. Then one of my biggest disappointments is the unfulfilled potential of Lloyd Banks and Tony Ayo of G-Unit. Both powers rise and G-Unit's fall are testaments to how growth is often the key element in any successful journey. I always felt that if I had done a better job teaching Banks and Yayo how to evolve and change their habits, they each would be in better places right now. Instead, they both stayed stuck in their mindset, and as a result, the success they desired has eluded them. In Banks' case, a lot of his failure to grow as an artist is connected to his emotional composition. Banks grew up in the same neighborhood as me, but was never a part of it in the same way. I actually hustled with his father. Banks was more content staying on his porch and watching the world from there. There's nothing wrong with that, but it underscored a particular aspect of his personality. Banks wanted things to come to him, as opposed to going out and getting them for himself. That's not me trying to assassinate his character. The guy has Lazy Lloyd tattooed on his arm. He literally wears his laziness on his sleeve. He's always projected an unhelpful mixture of being both introverted and cocky at the same time. The kind of person most comfortable being a big fish in a small pond. If Banks was hanging out in the studio with a bunch of unknown MCs, he'd be very confident. He'd enjoy being the center of attention. But if I suddenly showed up, he'd feel like he got demoted. He'd be bitter. He didn't feel like the center of attention anymore. I get it. I can take up a lot of the air in the room. The problem is that he'd never fight to get some of that oxygen back, which is exactly what a star is supposed to do. I believe a true star must possess four fundamental abilities. Create great material, be a high-energy live performer, have a unique appearance, and possess a strong personality. Now, before I get into the last artist was the overhaul that G-Unit had in 2005 when they signed Mace, Mob Deep, and Spider Loke, but I'm not even going to get into that because it was a failure and not even worth mentioning. The only thing worth mentioning was that Blood Money by Mob Deep was a dope album, but it's Mob Deep, so go figure. Last but not least, we have none other than Young Buck. Buck became linked with G-Unit through UTP in 2002, as I mentioned earlier, and from there, 50 Cent signed him to G-Unit to be the face of G-Unit South. 2004 would be the year that Young Buck would drop his debut album. On July 2nd, 2004, Young Buck dropped the first single, Let Me In, featuring 50 Cent. This song did peak at number 34 on the Billboard 100, but like I said earlier, you get Prime 50 on a track, it's going up. After that, Buck wasted no time dropping his debut studio album straight out of Cashville on August 24th, 2004, which the album peaked at number 3 and sold 261,000 copies within the first week, which wasn't the best, especially considering he had 4 50 cent features and Ludacris, who was one of the best-selling artists in 2004. Buck's solo career was off to an iffy start, I guess we can say, but he did have some hits on this album, including Shorty Wanna Ride, which would peak at number 17 on the Billboard 100, becoming Buck's highest charting single to date. But just like the rest of G-Unit, after his debut album, it was straight out of Cashville and straight to the bottom for Young Buck. Buck didn't drop anything for another three years, except his independent album in 2005 that you probably didn't even know existed. Let's cut to the chase. On March 27, 2007, Young Buck dropped his second and final album with G-Unit, Buck the World, which debuted at number three on the Billboard 200 chart, selling 140,000 copies in the first week, just 3,000 copies shy of tying Lloyd Banks' flop. If you want my personal opinion, I actually like majority of the album. It also has one of his best songs he ever made called Get Buck. But other than that, this album was a commercial flop and the final nail in the coffin of the already buried career of Young Buck. In 2008, June would make a comeback and in a very promising way. On February 12, 2008, June had dropped their comeback mixtape Return of the Body Snatchers, to which Young Buck didn't appear on this tape at all due to his ongoing issues behind the scenes between him and 50. This mixtape is an absolute masterpiece to me. Top to bottom is a great mixtape and a really good start for a G-Unit comeback. 
The next month, Juna followed up with the Elephant in the Sand mixtape. Of course, this mixtape was dedicated to dissing Fat Joe. Young Buck actually made his return on this mixtape, and this was once again another amazing mixtape by G-Unit, so now fans were awaiting the album. The next month, on April 22nd, 2008, both singles for TOS actually dropped. Rider Part 2 and I Like The Way She Do It. I Like The Way She Do It was the more successful of the two, peaking at number 95 on the Billboard Hot 100, while Rider Part 2 didn't chart on the Hot 100 at all. On July 1st, 2008, G-Unit's second studio album, TOS, Terminate On Sight, was released, debuting at number 4 on the Billboard 200 with a measly 102,000 copies sold, and it was at this moment that 50 Cent was ready to move on from G-Unit, as he knew that this ship has completely sailed. Now, I personally like this album. I think it's very underrated and overlooked. So if you want to listen to a good G-Unit project, check it out. After the release of this album, G-Unit would split up, starting with Young Buck. In 2008 would be the final year in a long time that we would see G-Unit as a group. It first started with Young Buck back in 2008. During this time, the game was going at G-Unit non-stop on mixtapes, so in 2007, Buck and the game actually linked up at a club in Vegas where Young Buck and Game were both performing at. It was rumored that Young Buck and Game got into an altercation, but this wasn't true. Security didn't let Game in because he thought that a fight would break out due to his ongoing beef with G-Unit. Young Buck actually got on the mic and told security to let Game in, and Game even said that he's cool with Buck. In 2008, Buck would publicly start badmouthing 50 Cent, saying that he didn't receive any money from 50 for the vitamin order deal that 50 Cent allegedly split with G-Unit. During this time, Buck was going through some problems with money and drugs. After this, 50 Cent would officially kick Young Buck out of G-Unit in April 2008 for inconsistent behavior, saying that Buck is on stage with his enemy at the time, Lil Wayne, but then Buck dissed him on TOS, and apparently Buck had missed recording sessions with G-Unit. After kicking Buck out of the group, Young Buck would call 50 Cent apologizing for acting the way he is, and he even started crying during this call. 50 Cent actually recorded the entire conversation because he knew Buck would betray him once again, and sure enough, 50 Cent was right. After this, 50 Cent actually released a phone call to the public of Young Buck crying on the phone. This is 50 Cent. Let me just get confused. Young Buck called wind of this, so he had enough and decided to drop a diss track on 50 Cent and June called Taped Conversation as his response to 50 Cent for leaking their phone call. And I know the only people record conversations is 5-0. Next, I slow. After that, Junit would completely implode as Young Buck was kicked out of the group and the declining popularity of Junit as a whole due to the lack of work ethic within the camp. 50 Cent would disband G-Unit. 50 Cent did respond to Young Buck when he dropped his fourth studio album Before I Self Destruct on November 9th, 2009. On the track Strong Enough, he looks back on G-Unit and takes shots at Game and Buck referring to Young Buck as a junkie. It was five of us, all of us millionaires, now one's a f***ing junkie. Not a single member of G-Unit had a feature on this album. The only sight of any of them was when Lloyd Banks did a part of the chorus on the track Get It Hot. But other than that, no sign of G-Unit. After this album, 50 Cent actually would take an extended break from rap music for over a year. In 2011, 50 Cent would make his comeback to music, but he didn't bring G-Unit along for the ride, as he was still done with the group. Throughout 2011, he would drop several tracks on his website and YouTube. On April 1st, 2011, 50 dropped the track called I'm All Turned Up. And at the end of the track, 50 goes on one of his infamous rants. During this rant, he actually disses Lloyd Banks and Tony Yayo, and then he says, the group referring to G Unit. See me, ask me where Lloyd Banks at. I don't know where the fuck that little nigga at. I ain't heard from Fuck yeah, yo, too, nigga. I'm on some new shit. Fuck the group, nigga. This was played off by many as an April Fool's joke due to the song being released on April Fool's Day. But if you know 50 Cent, I would take that with a grain of salt. It would be later in this year that G Unit would slowly reunite. When 50 Cent dropped his mixtape The Big Ten on December 9th, 2011, to which Tony Yayo featured on two of the tracks. On this mixtape, we would also see the debut of G Unit's newest member, Kid Kid. Kid Kid and 50 Cent would do several songs throughout 2012 and 2013. In 2014, 50 Cent was gearing up to drop his fifth studio album, Animal Ambition, and on March 18th, 2014, he dropped the music video for his track, Hold On. Tony Yayo originally appeared in the music video, but 50 Cent edited him out of the video. A couple weeks later, 50 Cent appeared on The Breakfast Club, and when Charlemagne the God asked him why he edited Yayo out of the video, he would go on to say that Tony Yayo and G-Unit are like spoiled milk. But Yayo, like, I put him in like four of the joints. 
I saw him in Hold On. He was on yeah, Hold On. No, I saw him barely in Hold On. I can tell they went and did some editing to, to get yeah, move them. somebody yeah. out. <laughs> but yeah, he knew. <laughs> the comic version yeah. had him a lot more. <laughs> and then we did, I tweaked him out a little bit. But you know what it is? It's, I think like some people are like, they're like milk. Mm -hmm. They have an expiration date. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And no matter what, you do, they'll spoil after a while. Nah, yeah, yo, that was your guy, nah, though. Listen, That's your myth bleak, man. Everywhere. Nah, but what I'm saying to you is I've done a lot for him mm -hmm. to the point that that, like, being personable with people, they'll feel like that homeboy code, guy code type of energy. Mm -hmm. right. They'll be like, yo, you know what? You got it, so you should give it to me. Versus what makes sense. Like, you didn't sustain, if you don't sustain your value in the marketplace, mm -hmm. I got to play you the market rate. Tony Ayo heard this, so he took to Twitter to respond to 50's remarks when he tweeted, As much bullets as I took for G-Unit, my mom's crib shot up, almost killed my sis and niece, now I'm compared to milk, I made that brand. A couple months later, G-Unit would reunite officially in June 2014 at Hot 97's Summer Jam when G-Unit reunited on stage with the addition of Kid Kid. This was the first time 50 Cent and G-Unit performed at Summer Jam in 10 years, due to them being banned in 2004 from the Bangham Smurf incident. This unit reunion would be met with a single, two EPs, and a mixtape. That's it. While the onstage reunion at Summer Jam 2014 was definitely an iconic hip-hop moment, this reunion was a letdown and just went nowhere. 50 Cent and Young Buck would start beefing again as 50 would just destroy him on Instagram, and from there, no music was released from G-Unit. What was it that made G-Unit fail as a collective? Was it the tensions with the group? Was it the unforeseen death of gangster rap? Or was it simply that the members of G-Unit were simply lazy and content with where they were at? To sum it all up, I think it was a mixture of all, but mostly laziness. The game is without a doubt the most successful artist to ever come out of the G-Unit camp. He went on to have a good rap career, and that's exactly why I think 50 Cent gave Game all of those songs on the documentary. He saw that Game was willing to work harder than everyone on G-Unit, and that Game had star qualities. While Lloyd Banks, Tony Ayo, and Young Buck had all the potential in the world, they were just not willing to step out of 50 Cent's shadow. A lot of people immediately point the blame at 50 Cent for G-Unit's demise, but look at it in 50's eyes. He put all of them in positions to win, and they simply didn't bother to make an effort or take advantage of the opportunity that was in front of them. 50 Cent gave Game all of his biggest songs and Game spit in his face. 50 put Lloyd Banks, Yayo, and Buck in positions to take over the world, and they each fell off after one album and got lazy. I can understand 50 Cent's frustration with G-Unit. G-Unit was supposed to be the new NWA, but egos and laziness killed it as a whole. Sure, G-Unit was the biggest thing in hip-hop at one point, but let's be honest, that was all due to the fact that 50 Cent was the biggest rapper in the world. G-Unit, while being a legendary rap group to me, could have been much more. Had Game stuck with Junin and didn't let Jimmy Henchman manipulate him, and had everyone consistently dropped music, Junin could have been much more than they were.